Good morning. There are a couple of things I wanted to say, and I just put my notes somewhere or other. It's not a good start. Hmm. I'll just have to remember what it is. Um, ah, wonderful. There they are. Thank you. The first thing I would like to do, this is the beginning of a two-day event, and speaking for myself at least, giving a speech is easy, interpreting the speech is the hard work. And if you would join me ahead of time in giving our interpreters a round of applause, that would be fabulous. I do it, of course, for two reasons. One is because they deserve it, and the other is they have my life in their hands for the next 90 minutes. Um, second thing that I want to say is this group, Wabi, that used to be called HSM, I've been working with for 25 years. They started in Brazil, and they are the best conference organizers on Earth. So for those of you who are new here, uh, You'll enjoy it, I assure you. Uh, in my prime, and of course I'm an old man now, as is true at a concert, there would be a warm-up act and then the main theme. My role today is to be Kevin Roberts' warm-up guy. I have known Kevin for a long time, and he is absolutely the real deal, and so I will do my best to prepare the way for him. One small thing I would say is the day after tomorrow, I'm going to be 71, and thank you. Now, thank you. Thank you for another reason. There is, I'm normally someone who's always on my own case, but the lovely thing about being 71 is when you wake up in the morning, it's already a good day. And uh, that helps. What, what are you going to do on your, se let me tell you what's nice about being 71, nothing. And so I am doing the closest thing I can possibly do on my 71st birthday where my wife is joining me and that is staying in Italy and going to Venice. I have been to Venice for my 60th and my 65th, and it doesn't get any better than that. So that's going to be a joy as well. Uh, a couple of other things. One other thing about 71st birthday is you've got badges. They gave me a badge, and somebody said, you don't have to wear the badge people know who you are, to which my response was, was, I'm 71, this is for me to remember who I am. Two final points before we get going. I want to give you my guarantee that in the next 90 minutes, I will say absolutely, positively, nothing new. My role in life is to talk about obvious things that we forget about in the heat of battle. I said to somebody one time, my real role is to remind you of what your grandmother taught you at about the age of nine, that in the hustle of business, we forget about. So that said, first things first. Conrad Hilton was arguably as good or better a hotelier than has ever lived anywhere. As his career came to an end, he was honored at a big gala event in New York City. People came to the podium, told stories about him, and so on. And at the end of that, Mr. Hilton was asked to come up, and what was said was, Mr. Hilton, we would love for you to tell us what were the most important lessons that you learned in your long and distinguished career. So Hilton, who was a distinguished-looking guy, 
walks behind the podium like this, he looks out at this audience of grand people and says, don't forget to tuck the shower curtain into the bathtub. And with that single remark, he turned and walked away. The reality is that you get them to come to the hotel because you had a great architect and you have a fabulous location. But nobody makes any money on the first transaction. You make the money when they come back the third, fourth, fifth, hundred and fifth time and tell their friends about it. You come, number one, for the architect and the location. You come back for the tucked in shower curtain. I worked in the White House 30 or so years ago and had a boss who was from the private sector. His name was Fred Malik, and he was the one who taught me this. Execution is strategy. I'm here because I wrote a book called In Search of Excellence. I wrote that book where I was, when I was working at McKinsey & Company. McKinsey & Company was all about developing strategy. And the McKinsey theory was, if you have a great strategy, the implementation will take care of itself. What my colleague Bob Wooderman and I said is if you get the execution right, it really doesn't matter what the hell your strategy is. And that is an extreme statement I would be the first to acknowledge, but there's also some truth. Uh, that's the title slide. I'm here to talk about excellence because A, that's what I do, and B, because I think it's one of the most important words in the language. We wrote the book called In Search of Excellence in 82. God was kind and a lot of people bought it. It was a decent enough book, I suppose, but I think a lot of the secret to its success was the word excellence. We are used to using the word excellence when we talk about the arts, talk about sports, and so on, but I don't think anybody had ever used it in conjunction with business. And to me, any organization of human beings ought to pursue it and can pursue it. Excellence means the same thing to me for a World Cup football team and a finance department. It is a collection of human beings attempting to do something of value, right? And they're all the same in that regard. Those are the bits that I'm going to try to cover. I've never finished one of my speeches yet, so I doubt that I will now, but I'll try. What's the definition of 2013? And as far as I can tell from wandering the streets here, it's as true as it is at home. Well, I saw it in a newspaper headline about a week ago. I think actually the headline came from New York City, and this is what it read. Train passengers too distracted by their phones to notice that a gunman had gotten on the car. And fundamentally, that describes the insane world of distractions in which we exist. Grin. The English interpretation, of course, is a smile. The New World interpretation is something very different. Genetics, robotics, informatics, and nanotechnology. We are in, we've had technology revolutions before. That's not new. What is new is the combination of these factors and the acceleration of change. We are confronting something in that regard that is totally different. I don't even know what this means. I think of China, I think of low-cost labor. China thinks of China, and one single company called Foxconn, all of your electronics are made by them. In the next 36 months, they will install one million robots. And that is a description. I mean, I, you know, I've wandered around automobile plants in a lot of my for a lot of my life. 30 years ago, you go to an automobile plant, and there's a lot of people and not many robots. And the robots that were there were A, doing simple things, and B, they never worked. 
Today you have something that's happened to us in America. God bless Kia. They're investing $250 million in the U.S. That's the good news. The bad news is we're going to get 100 jobs. And the rest of it is fundamentally the technology. So that's one side. When automation came to my father's office 40 years ago to the back office in an accounting company, it probably took a couple of jobs from clerks that were low paying. In the United States where everybody sues everybody for everything else, if you have one of those giant lawsuits, Samsung versus Apple, there's something called the discovery process where the Samsung guys look at the Apple documents and the Apple guys look at the Samsung documents. It is such a big affair that sometimes there will be a warehouse with 500 lawyers reading documents. Now what is a lawyer? A lawyer is a high paid white collar profession, right? Well, welcome to the new world order, the world of algorithms. We call the process of looking at your documents discovery. I'm trying to discover, as we would call it, the smoking gun, somewhere where you said something you shouldn't have said. There is a company called iDiscovery, little i, big D, kind of like iPad or iPod. Relative to those warehouses with lawyers, one lawyer can now do the work of 500 lawyers. You know the definition of that, right? Incredible unemployment for our best university grads. It is crazy. I'm not arguing it's going to happen. I'm going to argue perhaps against it, but that's the game that we're involved in. Look at this. I laughed and then I cried. It comes from a book called Robot Futures. The definition of future is a decade. And the author writes, human level capability has not turned out to be a special stopping point from an engineering perspective. That is, in those auto factories, the robots can now do things that a human being couldn't have imagined. What happens with this eye discovery? It happens a thousand times faster and they find more stuff. So we are up against the wall. There's a number, you would understand that. It hasn't exactly been a lovely five years in Italy. But as we came out of the recession, the company started spending money. And as you can see the numbers there, a 26% increase in capital expenditures. And the bottom one said, but the payrolls didn't change. And if the payrolls don't change in an inflationary environment, it means that de facto they're going down. Now you have a little piece of paper that I gave you, and I could stop my speech right here. I was invited last June to go to a very highfalutin world conference in Seoul. It was like the Davos thing, but it was private. Among the keynote speakers, I was the only one who had not been a prime minister or did not have a Nobel Prize. And so I thought, well, I can't compete with them, but I do know a little bit, I think, about business. And I said, and of course Mr. Schrader is going to address you this afternoon, Chancellor Schrader, and I said, look, I don't know a damn thing about euros, but what I do know is that there are seven billion people on earth, there are four billion working people on earth, and I don't know what the hell they're going to be doing 25 years from now. 
and I then switch to effectively this, and my comment was, Italian, Norwegian, American, Angolan, the number one response, the corporations, even with a lot of government, which you have and we have, employ most of the people. And therefore, in my opinion, regardless of whether your organization has two or 200,000 employees, at the end of the day, your primary responsibility is to develop and grow the people on your payroll. Now, I'm not talking about waving guns around, but it is, it is your patriotic duty to Italy and mine to the United States. Because what is a country about? End of the day, it's all about development of human capital, isn't it? For Italy or America or anybody else, we call them citizens. But that's what, isn't that the whole point? And that falls on your shoulders. So at the end of the day, this is it. Your principal moral, moral obligation as a leader is to develop the skill set soft and hard, the science and the people stuff, of every one of your people, temporary or permanent, to the maximum extent of your abilities. And as I've been saying for the last 30 years, the good news is if you take care of the people, they take care of the customers, and the customers take care of the profit. So as somebody said in reviewing a book of mine in 1987, Tom Peters has said that the right thing to do is also the profitable thing. And yet I'm sure the Italians are as bad as the Americans. The corporate statement says our people come first. And if you look at the activities, it's a long way from what we do. So I'm done. That's my message. As some of you know, we wrote a book in 82. And as I promised that I'm here to talk about your grandmother, there's nothing special in the book. If this is too many words for you, I can summarize 300 pages, 320 pages in four words. That's what it's about. People, customers, action, and values. Basic stuff. But the basic stuff that gets lost in the midst of financial manipulation, the development of complex strategies that Einstein couldn't understand, and so on. Now, I want to say something like what I said a minute ago, but in a different way. Five years ago, I was invited to give an all-day seminar in Siberia. The global economy is such that the Siberians were as worried about participating in the global economy as you are and I am. I guess it may be a Cold War perspective to some extent, but that's what I lived through. If you go to Siberia and do not ask yourself, what in the hell am I doing in Siberia? your next stop should be a mental health professional. If you are interested in the picture, this was taken from the window of my aircraft. This is a color photograph in May. Well, so I'm talking to people they were all smarter than you and me. It was in Novobirsk, which is their science city. These were the people who did everything from the nuclear weapons to what have you. And so I wasn't talking down. But you're welcome to laugh at the next slide. But you see, there's no such thing as a 71-year-old who's not cynical. And so I don't look at the world, to use our term, through rose-colored glasses. But as I said at the very beginning, I do believe that we have the power and the opportunity 
to create organizations that are special. And so when I read this next slide to you, your first instinct may be to say, that's absurd. And I'm not saying it's what happens every day. But what I am saying is that I think this is a legitimate aspiration. And if you look at the words and then look at their opposite, well, here it is. This is what I said. Enterprise at its best is an emotional, vital, innovative, joyful, creative, entrepreneurial endeavor that elicits maximum concerted human potential in the wholehearted pursuit of excellence in the service of others. And you may well say, that's too much. And I say to you, in plain English at least, well, so what do you want, an unjoyful environment? I'm not saying we get there with any degree of regularity, but I'm saying if that's not the aspiration in the morning for the finance department, the training department, the restaurant, or the 80,000 person company, I don't get you. I don't understand you. When your spouse goes to work in the morning, what do you say as they're leaving? Have an average day, dear. Look, many, all of us, I hope, love our families. We love our kids. But unless you were born with a lot of money, you are going to spend the majority of your waking hours as an adult at work. And so if you throw that away, you have effectively thrown your life away. Statistically, right? And so we'll talk a little bit about leadership. These are some random points. Bob Waterman and I, in 77, when we began our research, visited a, we were in San Francisco. We visited a relatively small company to try to learn something from them. The small company, which has grown up a little bit since then, is called Hewlett Packard. And we learned from their president about this term called MBWA. And the term stands for managing by wandering around. With all due respect, arguably the number one sin of the very senior people who are the principal part of this audience is losing touch. Staying in the office, not making it into the plant. That may be my favorite number in the world. Starbucks is an enormous company, right? They got 15,000 shops. They've obviously got great staff. And yet their founder and CEO, Howard Schultz, says that he religiously, he religiously visits a minimum, a minimum of 25 Starbucks shops per week. And he said, look, it's a big company, but at the end of the day, it's one of my people selling a cup of coffee to one of my customers, and unless I can see that and feel that and taste that and smell that, I don't know what the hell's going on. And so the whole MBWA thing for me over the next 30 years became more than the term it became the whole idea of being in touch. Now what am I talking about? Chief executive officers of large companies? Oh no. I'm talking about people in middle-sized companies with 50 employees where the boss stays in her or his office all day 
and never quite makes it out to where the work's being done. Not because you're an idiot, because you're doing what you're supposed to do, handling the problems that come across your desk, right? And then at the end of the week, you haven't visited the people in the shops, you haven't visited the people in the factory, you haven't visited the people in the office where a funny thing happens, that's where the work is done. The definition of a boss is a human being who stops doing useful work, right? Bosses don't make money in the hotels. Bosses don't tuck the shower curtain in. Well, I think it was Stephen Covey who introduced me to this. He referred to the anatomical fact that we got one mouth and two ears. Translation, a medical doctor by the name of Jerome Groupman wrote a book called How Doctors Think. And he said, when you have a problem, a medical problem, what is the best source of his evidence that he collects about your ailment? You. You have a 20-minute conversation with the doctor, and most of it's useless, but in the course of those 20 minutes, he gets a lot of tips, right? So then, based on hard research, Brutman asked the question, on average, when does the doctor interrupt the patient. And I would be hard pressed to believe that Italian doctors are any different than American doctors. Or German doctors, Portuguese doctors, Spanish doctors. I know we have a very international group here. The doctor interrupts after 18 seconds. Now, I'm not here today to talk about medical doctors. I'm here to talk about bosses. And this room, I suggest, is loaded with 18-second bosses. You've been around. You know the story. You start talking, and I say, oh, yeah, I know that. And I interrupt within 18 seconds. I mean, I'm the worst of all. I get paid a lot of money for talking. I've never gone 18 seconds without interrupting. And if you don't believe me, ask the ghost of my mother. So in my most recent book, I wrote about listening. Oh, by the way, stopping point. If you were a speed reader, on my title slide, it said that all of my slides are going to be by this afternoon when the Americans wake up at TomPeters.com. And there are a lot of situations like this where this is the first of five slides and time only permits the use of one and the slideshow that will be up has got all the rest of the stuff. But anyway, listening, simple word listening, isn't this accurate? It is the ultimate mark of respect. It's about engagement, kindness, thoughtfulness, collaboration, partnership. It's what makes joint ventures grow and so on. Now here's the problem I've got. And I'd ask you to listen to me carefully. And you don't have to agree with me. You don't have to agree with anything that I say today. Playing the cello is a difficult profession, right? Well, you're a boss. You're not a cello player. What do you do for a living as a professional? You listen. When I wrote my last book, I had a section on listening. And I went to Amazon.com. 
and I wrote listening, and I found a hundred books. Most of them are probably lousy, but the point is, it is a profession. Listening, here's what I want to say, please think about it, even if you disagree. Listening is as much a profession as playing the cello. Listening is what the hell you do for a living. And it turns out that you can study it, you can practice it, and you can become a professional. Now I want to anticipate something I'm going to say in a few minutes, and I'm talking to you, this gentleman right here, not to her. There's a genetic issue here. Men are genetically incapable of listening. It is said that it's possible that men listen, but we haven't found one yet. As I will subsequently say, this is not a trivial point. We used to work in hierarchies, big steep hierarchies, where the boss gave the order and somebody else did what they were told. Today, if you're on a 50-person product development team, it consists of people from 20 different companies, 11 different countries, and three different continents. And you can't issue orders. And so you have to do things, I mean this is a long-winded way of saying what I'm going to say later on, that women are demonstrably better bosses and you know it's like wake up guys, the game's over. And I don't mean it entirely, but I sort of mean it. We'll get there later. Oh, oh yeah, by the way, how many of you are involved in businesses where you sell something to somebody? Okay, well, I'm going to provide you with incredible statistical evidence now. Do you know who buys it? Women. It's all, I'm not that smart. I was trained as an engineer, but I'm not that smart. So I got a business where women are 80% of the purchasers and 20% of the executive committee. Based on my shockingly high intellect, my comment is, something's wrong with this picture. We'll come back. And, and at least in the United States, incidentally, I doubt that it's as true here. Women are now more than 50% of purchasing professionals. So she is as likely to sign the five-year, $1 billion information technology contract as she is to pick the family vacation. We will return to this. I said this is obvious. The great American psychologist of a hundred years ago, William James, said the deepest principle in human nature is the craving. I'm sure our interpreters will do a fabulous job on this. Not desire, not longing, but craving the desperate need to count for something. And in the average workplace, you don't get much of that, you know? Some guy wrote at my website a wonderful little post. He said, what are the four most important words in the English language. Translation of this one will obviously be easy. And they are, what do you think? I mean, there are two good points about this. A, you will learn something. B, what, when I say that to you, what I'm doing is saying you are a human being of importance. I want to learn something from you. As one writer put it, employees who do not feel significant rarely make significant contributions.
This is key. Well, I hope all these points are key. I was in the Navy for four years. I know a little bit about the military. If the regimental commanders lost most of his lieutenants and captains and majors, it would be a tragedy. If he lost his sergeants, it would be a catastrophe. Sergeants in the Army, chief petty officers in the Navy, run the place. Well, I'm not here to talk about the Italian Army or the Italian Navy or the American Army or the American Navy. What I am here to say is the most important set of human beings in your organization are the first line bosses. Period. As somebody said based on research, people leave managers, not companies. I don't leave your company because it's a bad company. I leave your company because this gentleman is an unpleasant manager. And your company is the greatest company in the world, but this gentleman, and obviously I'm not talking about you personally, but this gentleman makes my life miserable and I don't care if you have the best damn company in the world, I'm out of here. Even if the job market's tight. So my argument here is, and my apology to those of you who I'm now about to insult, any idiot can be a vice president. Being a good first line supervisor is solid gold. And so as I said with listening and as I will say in a few minutes, the point is, question is, do you have an extraordinary set of first line managers who have been trained brilliantly? I can't speak for Italy, I can speak for America. Most first line supervisor training stinks. Not true. It's just, it's neither here nor there. But I'm sure it's as true in the Italian army as it is in the American army. They don't worry about the lieutenants, they worry about the sergeants, right? And the training is infinite. Italian army, American army, Russian army, any army. And we don't do it in business and I don't know why. Leaders do people. Kind of gets back to that little printed page. You are not paid to develop a brilliant strategy. You are paid to find somebody who develops a brilliant strategy. And so here is my comment to you. Nobody forced you to become a leader. It was a voluntary choice. You chose to be a leader, therefore, you chose to devote the rest of your professional career to developing your fellow human beings. It's what you get the paycheck for. You don't get the paycheck for being a good accountant anymore, even if you were a great one at the age of 24. You don't get the paycheck for being a clever marker, you, marketer. You get the paycheck for developing an extraordinary marketing department. You chose. Nobody said you got to be a boss. And so if you chose to be a boss, you just, I mean, <laughs> read the words precisely. You in this room, and the more senior you are, the more true it is. You in this room, everybody in this room has the same job. Developing people. You may be in the army. You may be in financial services. You may be in hospitality. You may be in consumer goods. You may be in highly technical professional goods. And that's what you do. So do me a favor, think about it. All I'm asking you is to think about this stuff. I don't, I'm not here to persuade you for heaven's sakes. I'm here for 90 minutes. I'm just asking you in a half a dozen 
situations in the course of the day to take a look. Took me three years and I put together, I mean, it finally occurred to me, Tom, what do you do for a living? Would you like the answer in one word? PowerPoint. And so I've written all these books, but what I do is PowerPoint. I come here and I do PowerPoint. And so I thought, I'm going to try to put everything together in one place. And at a website that we own called excellencenow.com, took me 36 months, you will find a 4,096 slide, 23 part presentation called All I Know in the World. Well, that's only a build up to this remark. Statistically, and the math is pretty difficult here, if there are 4,096 slides, one of them has got to be your favorite. Right? And this is it. The extraordinary Richard Branson said it. Business has to give people, and think about those comments I've made three or four times already, business has to give people enriching, rewarding lives, or it is simply not worth doing. Look, I want you to grow market share, and I want you to make money, okay? The only way you can do it is by having the best people in the world, right? <laughs> this is a stupid conversation. If we were talking about a football team, I mean, it's not the most brilliant statement to say that a football team that has no talent is not going to have a good year, right? Well, tell me the difference between a bank and a football team. My answer is zero. Tell me the difference between a training department and a football team. My answer is zero. Look at the exact words, please. We have a profitable airline in America called Southwest Airlines. The boss, Herb Kelleher, was asked the same question Mr. Hilton was asked a thousand times. What are your secrets of success? And he always gave the same answer. You have to treat your employees like customers. I ran around for 10 years, 20 years saying, put the customer first. I don't say that anymore. What I now say is, if you want to put the customer first, you must put the person who serves the customer more first, whatever that means, right? Well, I spoke in Australia at a conference honoring the work of Peter Drucker. I was the keynoter. I took my responsibility very seriously. And so I wrote something called the manager's oath of office. And you can look at it at your leisure, but the one key point is the one in red. Hence, our job as leaders, the alpha, the omega, and everything in between is abetting the sustained growth and success and engagement and enthusiasm and commitment to excellence of those people, one at a time, who directly or indirectly serve the customer. I hate mission statements. They tend to be written by an executive team at an off-site retreat who's had far too much wine to drink. But I actually like this one. It comes from the giant marketing services company, London-based, called WPP. And it says, our mission is to develop and manage talent, to apply that talent throughout the world for the benefit of clients, and to do so in partnership 
and to do so with profit. I am a capitalist. I believe in profit. The more the better, because I can try interesting things and hire great people. But the point is, you don't pursue profit. Profit is the byproduct of the development of people, isn't it? That is the horse that comes before the cart. This is what, this is what you're dying to do. Robert Altman won a Lifetime Achievement Award, Oscar, as a director. And in his acceptance speech, he said, the role of the director is to create a place, space, where the actors and actresses can become more than they have ever been before, more than they ever dreamed of being. And my point to you is this is as true about the hotel housekeeper as it is about the scientist in the pharmaceutical company. Let's go back to hotels for a minute, right? Who is the human being in the hotel who has the most direct contact with a guest? Who is it? The housekeeper. The housekeeper. So as I said before, any idiot can be a vice president, but being a housekeeper and doing a great job at customer contact, now that's a big deal. And if you are a hotelier, and I'm speaking to you as I would speak to a fellow American, not as a guest in Italy, if you are a hotelier, I bet your training programs for your hotel housekeepers are not exactly scintillating. A brand is not a sexy marketing campaign, it's the talent, right? A football team is not a great stadium, it's a great collection of players, isn't it? I'm as much a champion of effective marketing as the next guy and more than most, but that's my brand. That's my brand. I want to go through a couple of things, three or four things very quickly. Pieces of the people puzzle. Number one, hiring. We all know it's important, but are you an effective professional? Right? As the head of management development at Google put it, development of great people, development can help great people be even better, but if I had a dollar to spend, I'd spend 70 cents on getting the right person into the door. And look, here is my point in the next 10 slides, okay? You don't disagree with me, hiring is important. But my question to the esteemed people in high positions in this room is, specific words, are you obsessed with hiring? So suppose your company buys a little company, right? Takes you a year to assess that little company. When you hire somebody, it's an acquisition, isn't it? They're the ones who make the bottom line work or not. Evaluating people. Same deal, we know it's important. We're not very good at it. General Electric's former chairman, Jack Welsh, and current chairman, Jeff Immelt, said that the number one market differentiator of General Electric is their ability to evaluate people. That's a mouthful. Training. I'm back to the Army, I'm sorry. In the Army, a three-star general worries about training. In business, it's a kind of a middle-level job. I would guess that a lot of you have chief financial officers and chief marketing officers. Well, damn it! 
in that row of executive offices sitting closer to the CEO than the CFO ought to be the chief training officer. That'd be the case in the Army, isn't it? You see, here's what I think. I'll be rude about it. The average chief executive officer thinks an investment, a capital investment, information systems, for example, is a strategic necessity, right? And you think training is an unfortunate need to do. I'll bet you, and I can't see any reason why it would be different in Italy and America, I bet if I sat down with a CEO of a big American company to talk about his or her business for an hour, I bet you they'd never mention training. And yet I bet if I was talking to the chief of staff of the Italian or American army, it's kind of all they'd talk about. Either they know something that you don't know or you know something they don't know. I'll vote for them. Promoting? The executive, on average, promotes two people a year. You worry about it, same thing I've said five times, but it's not an obsession. You're in a job for five years, you make two promotions for year, per year. Those ten decisions are the most important decisions you will make. Those ten people who you promoted are your legacy. And Peter Drucker put it well. He said a promotion decision is a life and death decision. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but I have to. I don't think that you don't take it seriously. I think you're not obsessed by it. Innovation. Whatever it is I do for a living, I've been doing effectively for 47 years. Since I was a junior combat construction engineering officer in Vietnam in 1966. And I'm not exaggerating. In the category called for sure, I've only learned one thing in 47 years. And the one thing in English is obvious and can be summarized by six words, W, T, T, M, S, W, should be obvious, whoever tries the most things wins. When the quality movement was hot as a pistol 20 years ago, there was an American idiot by the name of Phil Crosby who said, do it right the first time. Speaking only of my language, that is the single stupidest statement that has ever been uttered in the English language. Somebody said to me one time, Tom, you're a pretty good speaker. What's your secret? And I looked him in the eye and I said, 3,000 speeches. I'm a lot better than when I started. I even read something about Beethoven. It was fascinating. Sorry, Bach. What's Bach's secret? He wrote a lot of pieces of music. Even if you're a musicologist, which you may be, you remember 10 of Bach's pieces as the famous pieces, right? He wrote well over 1,000. He was talented, sure, but you write 1,000 pieces and the odds get a hell of a lot better that you'll get 10 of them right. 
You know, I think of particularly, I think of it when I'm in Italy. I've given 3,000 speeches. I've never given a good one, but I came close once, and it was in Bologna. And we had a rockin' and rollin' day. I don't know why the hell it worked, but it did work. And I've never come close since. But you know, if I live past my 71st birthday and give 4,000 speeches, maybe the hell I'll finally get one right. Somebody asked Tom Hanks if he'd ever had a good movie. He said, not yet. Ross Perot started the first big information services company called EDS, sold his company to General Motors. He was asked by a reporter, what are the differences between EDS and General Motors? He said at EDS, our strategy was ready, fire, aim. At General Motors, the strategy is ready, aim, 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 aim. And the secret to success is doing it and then fixing it. Michael Bloomberg is about the fifth richest American. He's mayor of New York, obviously, but he started Bloomberg. And in a book he wrote about Bloomberg, he said it perfectly. We made mistakes, of course. Most of them were omissions we didn't think of when we initially wrote the software. We fixed them by doing it over and over again and again. We do the same thing today. While competitors are still sucking their thumbs, trying to make the design perfect, we are already on prototype number five. By the time our rivals are ready with the wires and screws, we are on number 10. It gets back to planning versus acting. We act from day one. Others plan how to plan for months. I get a new idea. I run across something I think is exciting. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but I'm excited by it. What do I do? I give a speech about it. How would you rate the speech? Awful. The next one's a little less awful. And after I've pounded this topic for 50 speeches or six years, it finally gets pretty damn good. But even if I'm the brightest guy in the world, and even if I'm a good speaker, the first 10 times stink to high heaven. A technology executive in Pennsylvania put it this way at a seminar I attended, my strategy is to fail forward fast. So this is the complicated version. W-T-T-M-S-A-S-T-M-S-U-F-S-U-T-F-W. Whoever tries the most stuff and screws the most stuff up the fastest wins. You want to know the definition of a winner? The person who has the most mistakes. A good friend of mine wrote a great book. He called it The Innovation Paradox. And the title of the book was Whoever Makes the Most Mistakes Wins. Second innovation point, we are what we eat. I find the next slide incredibly scary. You will become like the five people you associate with the most. This can be either a blessing or a curse. Let me translate this into plain English, and our interpreters will translate it into plain Portuguese and plain German and plain Italian, etc. If you spend time with boring people, you will become more boring. If you spend time with exciting people, you can't help it. You'll become more interesting. And so therefore, and this is true of our children in particular, I've read some interesting research. Parents don't make a damn bit of difference 
other than helping decide who their kids are going to spend time with. It's their peers who set the tone, not you. And so what I'm saying is every single decision you make, who's on your board of directors, who do you hire, who's your consultant, every one of those decisions is a strategic innovation decision, isn't it? It's about who you spend time with. That's the only damn thing you got, the people you hang out with, right? This is a little personal. Gary Hamill put it this way. This is very sophisticated. The bottleneck is at the top of the bottle. Where are you likely to find people with the least diversity of experience, the largest investment in the past, and the greatest reverence for industry dogma at the top? If you ever want to find a group of boring people who all have the same background, it's called your average board of directors. They grew up in the same places, they went to the same schools, they drink the same wine, they think the same thoughts, they follow the same sports teams, and guess what? They all think alike. And nothing, you know, nothing has happened interesting at a board meeting and let's say, let's be nice, the last 20 years. TGRs. Here's a scary statistic comes from research done by Bain and Company. Customers describing their ex service experience as superior with your company, 8%. Companies describing the same experience as superior, 80%. If this came from Sam and Alice's consulting company, I might laugh it off. Bain does good work. So how do we deal with it? Well, I call it TGRs, things gone right. Obviously improving the quality, reducing the things gone wrong. This was a measure they used in the American automobile industry is important. But consider the automobile industry today. In terms of automobiles that work well, there is virtually, and I know I'm going to insult all the Germans in the audience, which I don't mind doing because I'm German, from a quality standpoint, there is very little to choose between the Korean Kia and the Mercedes-Benz. The Mercedes is 10 times sexier, but the Kia will give you 250,000 miles and so will the Mercedes-Benz. And so the focus is on things gone right. So my wife has a home furnishings company. She was working in New Delhi. I was giving a seminar in Mumbai. I finished first. I flew to meet her in New Delhi. I had heard about a company called airline called Kingfisher Air, and so I took them, flew with them. So we're getting ready to land in New Delhi, all right? They had a pretty big business class, and probably the average age in the business class was 45. And like these two gentlemen and me, most of us wore glasses. So we are coming down to land in New Delhi. The flight attendant walks up to each one of us and says, may I clean your glasses, sir? I have flown 9,000 flight legs. Nothing like that had ever happened before. Now we talk about strategic this and strategic that, right? On the day I die, I will remember my wife, my children, my dogs, and a woman who cleaned my glasses when we came into New Delhi.
I'm going to tell you one more story like this, and it actually brings tears to my eyes, as silly as it is. I would guess that in doing those 3,000 speeches, I have flown 9,000 flight legs. I saw something a few months ago that was the first time I had seen it. So your airlines, our airlines, your meaning people from Portugal, Brazil, Argentina, Germany, Italy, the United States, when we're getting ready to board, there are always a handful of people in wheelchairs, right? So we have that airline I talked about before who said your customers, your number one customers are your employees, Southwest Airlines. I'm flying from Washington, D.C. to Albany, New York on their plane. There are five or six wheelchairs. Picture this, please. There are five or six wheelchairs lined up to go on, okay? You with me? The pilot coming off another flight is getting on the plane. Are you with me? As the pilot gets ready to get on the plane, he comes up to the gentleman in the first wheelchair and says, Sir, I listened to him, would you mind if I took you down the jetway in your wheelchair? I'm standing there and I started crying. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. I've been flying regularly since 1974. That's 40 years. 9,000 flight legs. Have you ever seen a pilot wheel somebody down the jetway and chat with them? I haven't. I haven't flown every airline in the world, but I can't think of anyone that I haven't flown. I haven't flown air nowhere yet, but that's the only one. Well, a lot of them don't go anywhere, so I guess I have. Yeah, same deal. An experience begins and ends in the parking lot. Disney's understood that forever. Who are the people who get the best training at Disney? Who are the people who have the best uniforms? Who are the people who are hired for attitude? The parking lot attendants. You may wait 50 minutes in line for a ride at Disney World, but if you have a fabulous experience with the parking lot attendant when you leave, just like that woman who cleaned my glasses, that's what you remember for the next 20 years. So we need a CXO, a chief experience officer. This is the new world order. We need a CNO, a chief engagement officer. The reality is with social media, every single one of your employees is a potential customer ambassador. As it was put in a business called Social Business by Design, customer engagement is moving from relatively isolated market transactions to deeply connected and sustained social relationships. This basic change in how we do business will make an impact on just about everything we do. Look at the statistics on the next slide. IBM embraced this thing called social business almost 10 years ago. Look at the next slide. 433,000 employees belong to IBM Connection, which is their internal social media that also interfaces directly with a customer. 26,000 individual employee blogs, 91,000 communities that make the supply chain work and make the customers happy and cut the innovation pr process down, 62,000 wikis, 50 million IMs a day, 200,000 employees are on Facebook, 295,000 employees are on LinkedIn, 35,000 employees are on Twitter, and they're all interacting with the customer as well as their fellow IBMers. This is a new world order. You do not have a company of 200 people and 11 of them have customer contact. 
you now have a company of 200 people and only the CEO doesn't have customer contact, the other 199 do. And I can't go through all this because I still got more to go. But as they said in the same book, the social employee, it requires people who are engaged, expect integration of their personal and professional life, buy into the brand story, born collaborators, listen, customer-centric and empowered change agents. This is big. This is not big, this is huge. LBTs, little big things. I wrote a book called Little Big Things. I love this stuff. Everybody talks about grand ideas. There is so much you can do with high leverage small ideas, it ain't even funny. We have a little retailer in the United States, you may have heard of them. They're called Walmart. Their revenues are 500 billion US dollars, which is what? About 375,000, 375 billion euros. They sell appliances like microwave ovens, computers, televisions. You're in a Walmart store and you have a shopping basket and you buy a microwave oven and it fills your basket, right? So what do you do? You roll your cart to the checkout and leave. Now, please listen to me carefully because this is very sophisticated. Some person at Walmart, surely they must have graduated from the Harvard Business School, said, what? Why don't we have bigger shopping carts? I repeat, this is Walmart, 375 billion euros a year in turnover. They put in big shopping carts. Listen closely. Their sale of sales of appliances went up by 50%. You did not need McKinsey and company and a PhD in the mathematical sciences to say, let's try a shopping cart. The next one is even weirder. Comes from Las Vegas. Where this gentleman is sitting, my introducer, that's a casino, all right? I am driving down this road. There is a road. I turn left. I drive into his casino. Now, please pay attention again, because this is sophisticated. Somebody said, what if the road into his casino was not 90 degrees, but a gentle curve. What happens? Twice as many people come to the casino. And you, you poor suckers in the big company, just spent $3 million on McKinsey and company to give you an incredibly sophisticated strategy that you could not possibly execute, and you should have just said, what do you think, and made the driveway curve a little. And the point is, remember ready, fire, aim. Remember whoever tries the most stuff wins. You don't get this stuff right the first time, the second time, and the 20th time, but the capital expenditure is zero. The time to trial is zero. And say so you try it 50 times before you get it right. But it's lying all over the place. We are so totally seduced by sexy consultants like McKinsey. And the only reason I'm allowed to make a remark like that is because I worked for him for eight years. I know the kind of crap, we, don't it? No, somebody will quote me. 
I know the extraordinary documents we turned out that upon occasion were never implemented. What was the occasion? 90% of the time, I'm being kind to McKinsey. Design, I don't have to talk about design in Italy, but I will. I have been talking about design for 15 years now, 20 years. And I had a glorious day when the smile on my face was bigger than it had ever been before. And that was the day about two years ago when the market capitalization of Apple Computer passed Exxon. I no longer have to give long speeches saying design is important. I just, I mean, it's not the same today or any other day. You remember that, right? It was so cool. I mean, it was cooler for me than it was for you because I have a brother-in-law who was about the number four job in Exxon. And so I just called him up on the phone and started laughing hysterically. And I said, guess what, baby? Good design is more valuable than oil. Anyway, the point is, and again, you know this, so I won't bore you with it, design is not about like and dislike, it's all about emotion, it's all about love and hate. Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, became the first woman to give the keynote address at the UN General Assembly in 2011, and she said this will be the woman's century. The Economist magazine is not given to exaggeration, and yet this is what they wrote a couple of years ago. Forget China, forget India, forget the internet, economic growth is driven by women. But a lot of you want to see hard numbers, right? You're tough guys. The size of the woman's market for goods worldwide is more than twice as great as China plus India combined. The women's market is worth roughly $28 trillion U.S. And I want to say something, and I want to say it not too loudly because I am in Italy, which is driven by design. Here is my little secret. Men are incapable of designing products for women. And this is as true for banking services as it is for fashion goods. Men do not understand women. Women are different than men. You can try until you're blue in the face. You won't get it. I'm not in favor of legal quotas, but I have what I call the squint test. And I squint at a picture of the executive committee, and I say, how much does this photograph look like the market we're serving? I don't want it one for one. But if I'm looking at $28 trillion worth of opportunity and I all eyeball that picture and I can't see any women, women also turn out to be better leaders. You look it up. I've been studying it for 18 years. You got more women in leadership positions, you make more money. End the game. I'm not saying we got to have 27 women and no men, but what I'm saying is we have to have significant representation. A woman who was a, ran a financial services company in Australia nailed me at a meeting and she said, okay, big mouth, what would you do if you took over a company? I said, I walk into my first meeting, there's an executive committee of 10, one is a woman. I'm not going to fire any of the men, but I promise you that 18 months from now there will be a 20-person executive committee and 11 will be women. Beyond big, my sincere apologies to the 
significant percentage of people in this audience who I'm about to insult. There is something that you can say with great certainty about ex large companies. And that something is they don't perform well over the long haul. Paul Omarad is an economist. I am often asked by would-be entrepreneurs seeking to escape from life within large corporate structures, how do I build a small firm for myself? The answer seems obvious. Buy a very large one and just wait. Remember our friend Mr. Branson? There was a famous quote. Somebody said to Mr. Branson, how do you become a millionaire? He said, be a billionaire and buy an airline. That's a funny line, this isn't. My old McKinsey friend Dick Foster studied the top 1,000 companies in the United States over a 40-year period. Look at this! None! Look, I'm trained as an engineer and I have an MBA, so I'm incredibly smart about this stuff, okay? I'm brilliant. None is a low number. I mean, statistically, you would have thought like one. None of the top 1,000 companies outperformed the market over a 40-year period, and the longer they had been in the database, the worse they did. So, I'm not an economist. But I remember when I tripped over this, I think it was in 1990, when I tripped, no, it was later than that, it was maybe in the 2000s. There was a time until recently, and I think it may be happening now, so you have China growing fast with a billion and a quarter people. You have the United States hanging in there with 315 million. You have the Japanese with 130 million. Albeit by 10 years from now, it'll be about six left. They're getting old. And then you got Germany with 80 million, who has consistently been the world's number one exporter. They had a great export quarter a couple of years ago. And I was on a hike in Croatia with the number four guy in BASF. And I said, Patrick, congratulations. You guys are doing well. He said, don't blame it on me. It's not Daimler-Benz, BASF, or Siemens. It is the German Mittelstand. I learned about them. I fell in love with them. I am a lover of the middle-sized company. The classic German middle-sized company is described by someone agile creatures darting between the legs of the multinational monsters. They own small markets. But what they demonstrate to me is that you don't have to be big to be great. But that's very sexy stuff. I'm now going to tell you about the two companies that I like most in the world. I am sure all of you know where Flemington, New Jersey is, right? I've lived in the United States for 71 years. I have no idea where the hell it is. I presume it's in New Jersey. And I'm sure all of you who have heard of Jack Welsh, have also heard of Joel Resnick, right? Well, Joel runs the red carpet store. Every time you see the Oscars or the Emmys, 
for the advertising prizes gathering. All of the red carpet is done by Joel. They own the red carpet market. These are the people I adore. I mean, Steve Jobs is cool, but he's got all that sexy equipment. These guys do it with red carpet. Don't you love that? I mean, you don't have to love it. I do. You may not enjoy this slide, but I'm having the time of my life talking about these guys. So my wife and I spend our winters in the South Island of New Zealand. We are about 15 miles away from a town that you've heard of because you were the one who said you knew where Flemington, New Jersey was. And given that you know that, I'm sure you know where Motueka, New Zealand is. <laughs> and so you got, do you know what a sea anchor is? Any of you? Hands up or I'll explain it a little. A sea anchor is like you drop a piece of cloth over the side and it keeps the boat from bobbing, right? But it's of interest to people who have little boats and it's of interest to people who have big boats like the United States Navy. In Motueka, you will find Coppins sea anchors. These are the best people on earth for sea anchors. They have a large contract with my former employer, the United States Navy. I love this stuff. Any idiot can design an iPad, getting the sea anchor right, that's serious. And I love this sentence. I'd never seen it before. I didn't see it till I was 69. But it's one of those silly things, and it's silly, and suddenly you look at it and you go, oh my God, be the best. It's the only market that's not crowded. And this also applies to you and me. It's a new world order. I wrote a book about 10 years ago called Brand You. And it wasn't about self-marketing, it was about survival. In two, the year 2000, I was on the cover of Time magazine long before iDiscovery software came along. And I said, thanks to the technology, 90% of white collar jobs around the world will either disappear or change shape within 15 years. I was off by a few years, but I was directionally right. But there is good news. And the good news came from the micro-lending Nobel Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus. This is the good news for your kids, even if it's too late for you and me. All human beings are entrepreneurs. When we were in the caves, we were all self-employed. Finding our food, feeding ourselves, that's where human history began. As civilization came, we suppressed it. We became labor. Because they stamped us, you are labor. We forgot that we're entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Page and Sergey Brin and their Joel Resnick, who runs the red carpet store, and their whoever it is who runs Cop and Sea Anchors. And the opportunities, as a couple of guys at, at MIT put it, are infinite. We are in no danger of running out of new, uh, new combinations. Even if technology froze today, we have more possible ways of configuring the different applications, machines, tasks, and distribution channels to create new processes and products that we could ever exhaust. So I'm going to conclude now. I've got 39 seconds left, and I think I can finish this in a minute and a half anyway. Please keep these three numbers in mind, okay? 
14,000, 20,000, and 30. Okay, you got it? This is a couple years out of date. 14,000 is the number of employees who work for eBay. All right? 20,000 is the number of employees who work for Amazon. 30 is the number of employees who work for Craigslist. Do you know, I know that the interpreters will get this right, is there some equivalent in German, Portuguese, Italian to the American phrase, there is more than one way to skin a cat? Craigslist is not the same as Amazon. I'm not stupid, but Craigslist has more unique visitors than either Amazon or eBay. And all I'm saying is welcome to 2013. There is more than one way to do things. And what I am arguing is that every time you have a project, ask yourself, where is the Craigslist option? the really crazier than hell option. Doesn't mean you're gonna do it, but I wanna see it. Well, I really hate speeches by people like me, except it's better here because at least he was an Italian, but the speakers go around quoting people who've been dead for 500 years. But Michelangelo got it right. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and that we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. Italian or not, you've probably read that a hundred times. Well, if I am alive at the age of 81, and if you invite me back to this Congress at the age of 81, this will be the last slide again. Thank you for your time. Have a good two days. Thanks. Thank you.